Hello everybody. Welcome to uh, Mr. Woodcock's U.S. History class. Today we're talking about Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Let's take a quick look at our agenda for today. Uh, what we want to do is we're, we're going to analyze Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. Remember, we've been talking about World War I. We've talked briefly and touched briefly about um, the 14 points before, but now we're going to get into exactly what they say. Uh, we're going to answer the essential question, what did Wilson's 14 points of peace say? How did they try to ensure future peace? Uh, your assignment is on Google Classroom. Hopefully you've already got it pulled up. I'll need you to have that pulled up while we're going through this video so that you can see what, I, what I'm seeing. And so you can kind of work through uh, the assignment because there's going to be points where I'm going to turn you loose to work on your own for a few minutes. So um, we're doing a 14 points of peace analysis. We're evaluating the 14 points and determining which of the main causes. Remember, we've talked about the four main causes of World War I, militarism, alliances, imperialism and nationalism that's the acronym m-a-i-n the main causes of world war one that woodrow wilson and his staff most believed caused world war one and analyze how the 14 points could have led to a lasting and just peace so if you go back to google classroom and you pull it up it should look something like this in the beginning um so again, our objective, what did President Wilson's 14 points of peace say? How did they try to ensure future peace? So the first thing we're doing um, is below is a word cloud made up of all the words from the 14 points of peace. The words that are the largest are repeated the most often. On the next page, list the 15 largest words you see. When you are done using the 15 words, predict and write a two sentence summary of the 14 points of peace based on the words that you see here. So again, what you're doing is you're picking out the words that you see most prominently to list on the next page. So, for example, you know, I see peace is very large, nations is very large. You know, that's two of them right there. All you have to do then is come down here to this section and just type out 15 of those words that you see. Once you're finished with that, there's a section here to write a two sentence summary. So, you're just going to take those 15 words and just tell me about what you think they might mean. Um, you know, peace, nations, international, what are, what are they trying to say in that word cloud? There's no right or wrong answer here. This is just totally up to you. So I want you to take a second, pause the video, and then come back to me and we'll continue on with our lesson. Okay. So now we're moving on to the next part of our assignment, which is we're going to actually take the 14 points and we're going to analyze them and see exactly what it is that they say. Um, the directions are prior to analyzing the 14 points apiece, rewrite them in your own words. In the table below in the left-hand column are Wilson's exact words. Read them first. In the right-hand column, rewrite each of the 14 points apiece in your own words. This might take a little bit of time, but you're just going to restate what's over here in some in your own language that help you understand it. Just a simple restatement. Some of them are, might be kind of difficult, but I want you to try it first on your own. Read them, see if you can decipher what they say. Um, I'm going to give you a few minutes to work on that. Go ahead and pause me again. Do this part on your own, and then I'll go through them and tell you, you know, what close enough to what you should have probably gotten. Um, on those sections. So go ahead, pause me, and we'll go through each one of them together. Now go ahead, go ahead and pause me and, and do that on your own. Don't worry about I'll be I'll be right here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go anywhere. Okay. I'm gonna be right here. Just waiting on you. Okay. So let's start at the top with the first text of primary source. So this is the this is the first point of Wilson's 14 points. It says this, open covenants or agreements of peace openly arrived at after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. So what does that mean exactly? Well, basically just to put it in real simple terms, it's no, secret treaties. And remember, we've talked about secret treaties. This is a big part of the reason why World War I breaks out, because all of these different groups or all these different countries have these entangling alliance systems, but nobody really knows who 
um, is actually allied to anyone else, especially the citizens of the country. They have absolutely no idea. So they're kind of left out of the loop. Wilson believes this is a big problem. So he says basically no secret treaties. All treaties need to be out in the open where everybody can understand exactly what they mean. Okay, so that's, that's number one, no secret treaties. Number two, absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, outside territorial waters, alike in peace and in war. So what does this mean? This means no naval blockades of any kind. No naval blockades. This is a big part of the reason why the U.S. gets involved in World War I is because of U-boat warfare, unrestricted U-boat warfare like we talked about in 1917. This is what brought the U.S. ultimately into the war. Um, and a big problem with that was that Germany was basically installing a blockade on American shipping. Uh, but the British have been doing the same thing to the Germans since the beginning of the war. So everybody knows that, that naval sea travel is extremely important uh, in uh, moving goods between countries, um, especially food. So there had been some really difficult times in places like Germany because of the British blockade. So Wilson says if we get rid of the naval blockades, this can help ensure a lasting peace, at least according to him. Number three says the removal so far as possible of all economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among all the nations consenting to the peace. So basically what he's talking about here is free trade. Free trade between all the nations who are going to sign this, this treaty. They're all allowed to trade with each other that they can't, that one country can't restrict the ability of another country to trade with somebody else. The free trade, free open market um, across basically the entire world. That's what number three says. These two are probably the, the most difficult of the ones we looked at to do the chart that we're gonna look at in a second. But we'll talk about it when we get to it. Number four, adequate guarantees given and taken that national armaments or military weapons will be reduced to the lowest point consistent with domestic safety. So this is something that, that gets talked about a lot at the beginning of the 1900s um, and now is, is being put in, into writing um, in an official capacity. And this is arms reduction. Unfortunately, Wilson's not gonna necessarily get his way, although they are going to agree to it in, in some respects. But ultimately, Wilson's not going to completely get his way here. Um, he wants a complete arms reduction. Um, that basically means, or what he's trying to say, we talked about militarism, right? Militarism is M in the main causes of World War I. Wilson believes that no country should have more weapons than it needs to defend itself. That's basically what they're trying to get to. Um, when he says consistent, right here, consistent with domestic safety, that means you have enough soldiers in your army, you have enough weaponry to defend yourself from invasion, but you don't have enough to go and actually conquer somebody else. That's the point that he's trying to make there. So that's what he's trying to get at. Okay, take a second and get those copied down if you have it already. I'm going to scroll up, which means I'm going to have to erase it. Okay, number five. A free, open-minded, and absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims based upon a strict observance of the principle that in determining all such questions of sovereignty or authority, the interests of the population's concern must have equal weight with the equitable claims of the government whose title is to be determined. So basically what this is talking about is popular sovereignty for colonies. Popular sovereignty for colonies, another word you could say is decolonization. That they're going to try to take colonies and they're going to try to let them have a rule over themselves. Popular sovereignty means the ability for you to determine for yourself how you should be ruled or who should have power. It's kind of like the United States declaring its independence from uh, Great Britain 
1776, that's an example of the United States trying to install its own popular sovereignty, which eventually we were granted um, through war. That's what Wilson is saying for the colonies of a lot of these countries um, that have these huge uh, colonial possessions overseas. If you remember from last year, we talked about um, carving up Africa, carving up China. Um, a lot of these nations, Great Britain, France, Germany have extensive colonial possessions around the world and the peoples who live there want to get rid of that. You know, people in India want sovereignty for themselves. People in China want their own sovereignty. People in Africa want their own sovereignty. So Wilson is basically saying that we need to start taking into consideration these people and letting them decide for themselves how they should be run. Now, of all his 14 points, this is the one that's probably going to get dealt with the least in the Treaty of Versailles, except for German colonial possessions, which will generally fall into French and British hands. Um, but most of the most of the French territories and British territories are going to be retained through the end of World War II. So they're not really going to listen to Wilson on that one, even though it was a good idea. Um, number six, the evacuation of all Russian territory and such a settlement of all questions affecting Russia as will secure the best and freest cooperation of the other nations of the world and obtaining for her an unhampered and unembarrassed opportunity for the independent determination of her own political development. That's a lot of words just to say, basically, leave Russia alone. That's basically what he's trying to say. Russia is, go is currently at this point going through uh, its own revolution. Now, when he writes this in 1917, the Bolsheviks haven't took power yet. If you remember Vladimir Lenin from last year, the Bolsheviks haven't taken power yet. In Russia, they're going through what you would what would be called the Kerensky government at this point, um, but they still are dropping out of World War One, and they're going to sign that embarrassing Brest-Litovsk treaty with Germany. Um, that uh, because Germany is going to knock them out of the war, that basically grants all of this territorial possession to Germany. Well, Germany loses the war, so they're not going to get to make good on any of those claims and. The allies are going to decide what to do with those. And I'm just going to show you a quick map here. I've got a map. I uh, don't know how well you can see it, but this is a map of Europe in 1914. We're going to come back to it again here in a second. But basically all this territory right here and Poland here are going to get ceded to Germany in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Ukraine, Poland, all these areas are going to get taken over by Germany. And the 14 points in the Treaty of Versailles are going to undo all that. And all of a sudden, you're going to see countries pop up on this map that hadn't existed in a long time. Now, Poland is a very old country that has existed for a long time, but it actually gets carved up in the early 1800s by the Russians and Prussians and Austrians. Um, but it's going to come back onto the map for a little while, and then it's going to get gobbled up again before World War II. Basically, it really stinks to be Polish. Uh, for most of European history, even though at times they've been very glorious and, and you know very powerful, but this is not one of those times. So we're going to come back to that map in a second anyway. Belgium, the whole world will agree, must be evacuated and restored without any attempt to limit the sovereignty, freedom, and authority which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. So basically... independent Belgium. Belgium is actually being occupied by the Germans at this point in the war. Um, the great irony of World War One is that the Germans actually never have to fight on their own homeland. Pretty much the entire war they're fighting somewhere else and they're still going to end up losing and surrendering despite never even being pushed back into their own territory. But they conquer Belgium in the first days of the war. That's what brings the British into World War One because of this old treaty that the British and the Germans have that goes back to like 1837, that basically the British uh, have determined um, that they are going to recognize Belgium's own sovereignty. Um, and, you know, when Germany invades, this is what ultimately brings Great Britain into the war. They're not just because they're allied with the French, uh, but it's the invasion of neutral Belgium that causes all that. Anyway, that's uh, getting into the weeds too much. Uh, the next one, 
All French territory should be freed and the invaded portions restored and the wrong done to France by Prussia in 1871 in the matter of Alsace-Lorraine, which has unsettled the peace of the world for nearly 50 years, should be righted in order that peace may once more be made secure in the interest of all. So basically what this is saying is, is restore Alsace Lorraine to France. Restore Alsace Lorraine to France. Um, let me show you the map. So if you're confused about this, it's okay. It's totally okay to be confused. So if you look at this map, this small area right in here, in between France and Germany, is a state called Alsace Lorraine. Um, it's actually two separate states, Alsace and Lorraine, but we just call them Alsace Lorraine because they're right next to each other. You know, whatever, Alsace and Lorraine. This is area right here. Now, the people who live there speak German. Okay? They speak German. So you would think it makes sense for them to be German. But for hundreds of years, they've been uh, French. They've been owned by the, the French government for hundreds of years. So when Prussia unites all of Germany after what's called the Franco-Prussian War that happens in 1871, uh, the Prussians unite with the rest of the Germans and they fight a war against the French. That's why it's called the Franco-Prussian War. As a result of that war, the, the Prussians defeat the French very quickly. That takes them about a year. Uh, they actually uh, take Paris and everything. Um, they signed a treaty in the Hall of Mirrors at, the, at Versailles, which if you remember last year is the uh, is where the king of France lived for all these years, in the Hall of Mirrors, this great big hall. They signed these documents that declare Germany a nation, um, but as part of that war and winning that war, they get Alsace and Lorraine. So for the last almost 50 years, Alsace and Lorraine has technically been a part of Germany, which really angers the French. So you understand now that the French winning the war means they're going to get Alsace and Lorraine back. So that's one of his, that's one of Wilson's points is that Alsace and Lorraine should go back to French hands, which it had been for hundreds of years, despite the fact that the people there are ethnically German and even speak German. So make sense of that how you will. All I know is to tell you that Alsace and Lorraine had lit, had been a part of France for you know hundreds of years. So you almost have to ignore the fact that they're that ethnically the people that live there are actually German. Whatever. Nobody said history always had to make sense. Um, point nine. A readjustment of the frontiers of Italy should be effected along clearly recognizable lines of nationality. This one's pretty simple. Extend Italian borders. If you look on the map, we're not going to go back to the map on this one, but basically there's some ethnically Italian people who were living in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But with the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they're going to be basically taken in uh, to Italy. Now, the Italians are not going to be happy about all the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, and it's going to be a big part of the reason why they end up on the side of Germany in World War II, because they feel like they've been you know, done poorly by the Treaty of Versailles, despite the fact that they didn't really contribute much to the Allies and actually pretty much every battle they fought in, they lost in World War I. But still, if they're Italian, they think they are entitled to a little bit more um, than they actually get. And that's gonna, that's gonna play a big part in the role of uh, uh, Benito, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini coming onto the scene here in a couple of years. He's really gonna play on that idea that they've been done poorly by the British and French. Okay, point number 10. The peoples of Austria-Hungary, whose place among the nations we wish to see safeguarded and assured, should be accorded the freest opportunity to autonomous or independent development. Uh, so basically what this is saying is independence for, I should say, for different
So let me let me say it out loud so you can write down independence for different nationalities in Austria Hungary. So there are a lot of different ethnic groups and national groups that are live inside of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They've been causing a lot of problems the last several years before World War One even breaks out because they want their own independence. So let's go back to our map. If you look in this yellow section here, all of this is the current Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now it used to even be larger than that. But inside of here, we have different countries that are going to form as a result of this war. You've got Bosnia, you've got Croatia, you've got Austria itself over here. You've got Hungary, which is going to be over here. So there's going to be several different countries that are going to get their own independence as a result of the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that's what Woodrow Wilson is calling for. He says these people shall have the right to govern themselves rather than be a part of this larger empire that's ruled by people that they have no control over. So that's, that's about what he's trying to say. All right. Same deal here. Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro. These countries that are right here. Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro. Should be evacuated. Occupied territories restored. Serbia accorded free and secure access to the sea and international guarantees of the political and economic independence and territorial integrity of the several Balkan states should be entered into. So that's a lot of words to say. Independent Balkan states and access to the sea for Serbia. The other countries, I think, have access to the sea. But basically, independent Balkans have the German army leave or whoever's occupying the Balkan nations at the time. Remember, this is where the war actually kicks off, World War I, because of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by a Serbian nationalist terrorist, basically, um, that, um, that these countries should be independent. They should have their own sovereignty. And Serbia should have access to the sea, which they didn't have at the time. Uh, which actually ends up causing a big problem because the whole entire Serbian army has to like leave Serbia because they get chased out by the Austri Austro-Hungarians and they have to board British ships and leave the continent basically because they get overrun in the early days of the war. So moving on to point 12. The Turkish portion of the present Ottoman Empire should be assured a secure sovereignty, freedom, and authority. But the other nationalities which are now under Turkish rule should be assured an undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity of autonomous self-government development. So basically, that's a lot. That's a big word salad just to say independent Turkey. A lot of independent nations coming out of this. Independent Turkey. Turkey had been part of the Ottoman Empire up until this point. Uh, a group of people called the Young Turks come onto the scene. They want an independent Turkey separate from the Ottoman Empire. And um, they actually start basically a revolution inside of the Ottoman Empire who is actively fighting in, in World War I. Um, people who have allied themselves with the British against the Ottomans. Um, and so... Um, Wilson agrees that they should break up the Ottoman Empire and give the people of Turkey their own independence. So, independent Turkey, if you look at the map, it's more than just this, but it's basically this section of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire comes all the way down here, um, but this section, modern-day Turkey, if you're familiar, you can look it up on the map. Modern-day Turkey will form as a result of uh, the Treaty of Versailles, in part because of Wilson's 14 points. I mean, he's not the only one who says things like this, but um, for our intents and purposes, he is. All right. Uh, an, ind an independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant 
slash agreement. So again, a lot of words to say independent Poland, or you could say Poland for the Poles. Basically the idea being that the, the territorial expansion of Poland should include all the Polish people. Uh, but it also says that they should have access to the sea. And let me show you why this is a big deal. If you look here, Poland is right here, that where Poland should be. Um, but they're going to take over, they're going to basically split Germany during the Treaty of Versailles. They're going to split Poland like right here, and then they're going to split this section off and make it East Prussia. And they're going to, in this territory, this area of land that connects um, Poland to the sea is known as the Danzig corridor and if you ever if you decide to take history in college you'll study a little bit about the Danzig corridor basically um, this is a big sore point for the Germans uh, following uh, World War one it's going to be a big part of the reason why Hitler is able to come onto the scene is he's going to take the Danzig corridor back uh, and connect East Prussia back to Germany again anyway so independent Poland and 14 says a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants or agreements for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. So this is him calling for that thing that we've been talking about and that we're going to talk about more later on this week. And that is the league of nations so the league of nations gets formed as a result of or this is this is his 14th point this governing body kind of like the un today this is the precursor to the un this is going to be the league of nations unfortunately as we're going to see this week the united states is never actually going to join the league of nations for a variety of reasons and we'll talk about those when we get to them but that's what it, wilson's calling for that's his dream is that there's this international organization that settles disputes between different countries to prevent wars like this from happening and ensure a lasting peace. Okay, so that's the that's the 14th point. That's the last point. So now you've got this chart. You've got each of the four main causes of World War One. Now they're going to throw assassination in there because that's the immediate cause of the war. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Just forget that it's there. We're not even going to use it. None of, none of these, none of the points are going to go with assassination. Wilson's not going to make a point trying to stop assassinations in the future because that's, you know, it's a fruitless task. I mean, that's, I mean, come on, like, that's just, it's not really anything one person can control. So what we're doing is we're taking the 14 points of peace. We're part of a speech that President Wilson delivered prior to the end of World War One, like we talked about. The points were meant to establish and ensure that another global conflict wouldn't erupt, as well as resolving the issues that led to war in the first place. How well do these 14 points connect to the causes of World War I? Using a concept map similar to the one below, connect each of the 14 points to one of the five main causes for the First World War. See the example below. So again, like I said, you just forget about assassination. Just act like it ain't even there. If you wanted to put the Serbian part point to it, I guess you could. But, I mean, to me, it, it goes somewhere else better. So the, the example they give you is already on your page, point number five, which is imperialism. I'll give you a little hint. That's the only one that goes with imperialism. The rest of them are going to fall under other categories. But anyway, they, they, all you have to do is draw. You don't even have to necessarily draw. Just as long as you put you know, the words on the, on the concept map closest to whichever point or whichever cause each of the points go with. So like point five goes with imperialism. I'll give you another one. Point number one goes with alliances. Talks about free and open um, treaties between nations, no secret treaties. That's dealing directly with alliances. Um, go through each of those points. Take a, take a few minutes. I'll pause the video. You go through each one of those points try to figure out uh, which of the causes they go with and put them on your concept map. Take a few minutes to do that, then come back to me and I will kind of show you where I believe each of them should be going.
All right, so hopefully you've already labeled your concept map. This is what I've, this is the way that I've done it. So points one, two, three, and 14 deal with alliances. Anytime that you're talking about trade, free trade, or, or the, the not impeding free trade, you know, through a naval blockade, you're probably talking about alliances. Now you could make an argument maybe that no naval blockades deals with militarism. Um, you know, to me, I think it's alliance. But if you put it there, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just your own interpretation. Uh, militarism, definitely point four. Point four absolutely goes to militarism. Arms reduction addresses the militarism problem. Uh, imperialism, we've already talked about point five. Um, that's really the only imperialism one. I mean, you could say maybe the breakup of some of the territories that we talked about could possibly be in imperialism, but mostly... Mostly those nations that existed for a long time, they weren't really colonial possessions. They're just parts of their of their country that had been for a long time. But if you look at nationalism, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 11, 12, and 13 all deal with nationalism. That's eight points um, of Wilson's 14 points that deal directly with nationalism. So if you were looking at this and you were to decide or ask yourself which one of which one of the causes of World War One did Wilson think was maybe the biggest cause? To him, it would certainly probably have been nationalism, right? I mean, eight points that he's implemented here deal specifically with nationalism questions. So you could say, and, and alliances also. Militarism and imperialism don't seem to factor that high on his scale. And the lack of attention on imperialism is going to cause big problems for not only the rest of the world, but also the United States in the future. Um, just a little sidebar, there's actually a guy at this conference at the, Treaty, at, the, at the Treaty of Versailles, I can't remember what he was calling himself when this happened, but he was there to represent Vietnamese um, popular sovereignty claims. They wanted the French to leave Indochina. Uh, a guy that you might know as Ho Chi Minh, the guy who, Charlie, the guy who was in control um, of North Vietnam, throughout uh, most of the Vietnam War until he gets deposed like really late in the war. Um, but he's actually at Versailles um, trying to get Vietnamese uh, freedom from France and Wilson basically just brushes him off. And of course that's going to end up causing the United States uh, almost uh, 50,000 50, plus lives um, dead at the end of their, uh, of their involvement in Vietnam. So some of these these aspects of the Treaty of Versailles are going to have long reaching effects. Now the Treaty of Versailles itself is going to be a major cause for World War II. So you have all of those deaths that have to deal with the Treaty of Versailles. And you have to say that the Treaty of Versailles is probably one of the most consequential documents um, of world history, if not just the 20th century. So a lot of problems as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. So anyway, I hope you filled out the concept, Matt. And if we go to the next page, the points of peace. Using information from the document above, please respond to the following task. Using the information from the documents above and your knowledge of U.S. history to respond to the following task. The 14 points of peace was a part of speech of a speech that President Wilson gave when addressing Congress in 1918. They were developed from a set of diplomatic points drafted by President Wilson, his staff of advisors, including other diplomats, and his Secretary of War after analyzing the excerpts above. So explain, what did President Wilson and his advisors view as the main cause of World War I? That's your first paragraph. You only have to write two. So this first paragraph, what did President Wilson and his advisors view as the main causes of World War I? We just talked about that, right? Just go back and rewind it if you don't remember. And then number two, and this one's kind of your own explanation, how did they see the 14 points as ensuring future peace? So what part of the, of the 14 points or what aspect of the 14 points do you think that they thought, so there's not really any right or wrong answer to this, that would ensure lasting peace? Or how would the 14 points in general ensure lasting peace for the rest of the world? And you only have to do it in two paragraphs here at the bottom. It even gives you a, a definition of explain if you didn't know. Okay, that's pretty much it for me today. I probably took up more of your time than I mean, meant to. And I know this assignment's going to take you a little while to get to, so I'm going to let you get to it. As always, I'm available if you have any questions um, on how to do this assignment. Um, just let me know. Okay. I'll talk to you guys later.